Right, well, uh, welcome everyone to our last meeting this year, I think it is. Uh, we will have a panel on some aspects of Leibniz's philosophical uh, theology. Uh, and our first uh, speaker tonight, or this morning, depending on where you are, uh, will be Asna uh, Grogart from the University of Oxford talking about Leibniz's early uh, emotionist uh, cosmogony. Um, Asna, you have the floor. Thank you, Claudia. Um, I'll just share my screen. Okay. So hopefully everyone can see the presentation now. Um, okay, so hello everyone. <laughs> my name is Osna Gregor. Um, I'm uh, writing my diesel thesis about Leibniz's cosmogenies. And this talk is based on parts of the second chapter where I look at Leibniz's Paris writings. And as the title suggests, I will argue that the cosmogony from this period can be termed emanationist. Uh, but before I start, I will just make uh, two small disclaimers. So firstly, when I talk about Leibniz's views at this time, uh, this can only be a slightly artificial analytic exercise. For as this audience will know, um, the writings themselves are very fragmented and often experimental. So there are many tensions within the writings from this period. And the second disclaimer regards the term emanation, which is notoriously vague and has a long and complicated history. So in its literal and original sense, it was used about natural phenomena and means to flow or trickle out of and the Plotinus used it to symbolize the necessary superabundance of the first principle, the one. And in the scholarship on Neoplatonism, emanation is often contrasted with uh, personal creation. And this is because emanation suggests a certain automatism, blindness, uh, and also a lack of distinction between the source and the overflowing. As Therese Bonin writes, um, the image of flowing does suggest a necessary process along with more unity between cause and effect than some may wish to admit. And it's especially this tendency towards monism perhaps or immanentism uh, resembling Spinoza that has been attributed to Leibniz under the name emanation. Uh, Andreas Blanc writes, uh, in several writings from the mid 1670s, Leibniz endorses a neo-Platonic emanation scheme that comes close to Spinoza's view of the relation between God's ideas and things in the world. And Catherine Wilson writes that Leibniz was attracted by a monistic emanation theory in this, this early period. However, there are other interesting similarities between Leibniz's early cosmogony and classic emanationist systems that tend to be uh, overlooked, I think, if one focuses too closely on this one uh, Spinoza's trait. So in this talk, I will attempt to broaden the term emanation a little bit and focus on some other similarities as well, of course, uh, as some crucial differences. So the first emanationist trait is the one that has been uh, most thoroughly discussed, uh, but it's important, so I will just go through it very briefly. So in emanative systems, it's not always so easy to distinguish between cause and effect. For although the emanative activity uh, always has both an inner and an outer aspect, it remains one and the same activity. So cause and effect are concomitant. And, and this is why Kant uh, has argued that um, emanation cannot really be external production for whatever emanates by necessity from the nature of a being must be imminent to that being. So in emanative systems, finite things are real only insofar as they turn towards their source, or as Spinoza would say, uh, insofar as they are seen from the viewpoint of eternity. And there has been uh, much controversy and discussion about whether the young Leibniz is a substance monist or not. Uh, but I personally find the monist reading of the Paris writings very convincing. There are many passages where Leibniz equates God and the universal harmony. And more conclusively, there are passages in the De Summarum, uh, 
where he explicitly says that God is the only substance and that all other things are modes. So this means that at this stage in Leibniz's development, the cosmogenic puzzle is not about how various substances arise, but about how variety arises in one and the same substance. And very generally, Leibniz's answer to this is that God creates himself. He is the causa sui. And, like, and God does this by reflecting on himself and relating his own perfections to each other. So he writes in one place that the most perfect being arises out of the conjunction in the same subject of all possible absolute forms or perfections. But from the conjunction of simple possible forms, there result modifications. So more on this later. <laughs> So uh, monism was the first suggested emanationist trait. The second trait is equally important. Uh, according to St. Basil the Great, emanation is a production that is automatic and unwilled, like a body's production of a shadow. And Basil considered this to be an insurmountable problem, of course, uh, with Neoplatonist theology, since automatic and unwilled sounds incompatible with a personal deity. But the young Leibniz did not think it incompatible. Um, unwilled in his case uh, should not be understood as God's not having a will, uh, but as God's will not playing a role in the actual production. So in the De Sumerarum, the world is produced by a mind, but it is self-reflection that does the work, not the divine will. As Thomas Feeney writes, um, the divine will figures in the account of finite existence only after the fact, as the capacity affected by harmony. So things already exist when the will appreciates them, so there is no need for the will to render thought effective. And as for automatic, uh, that should be understood as, as God's essential activity. For Leibniz's God produces insofar as he exists. As Leibniz writes, God has always created something. My father has never yet ceased his work. So the early cosmogony can be seen as emanationist in the sense of being both automatic and unwilled, only not in the sense of impersonal, only very strictly intellectualist and uh, as something that is essential to God. A third trait uh, is that emanation is production out of the divine essence, not out of nothing. And this is, of course, in opposition to the Christian axiom of creation out of nothingness. Augustine writes that only perfection can result from perfection. And so from himself, God did not create, but begot that which was equal to him, that is the son of God. And Leibniz, as we know, wavered on this question. In the Theodicy, he cites this precise passage from Augustine, uh, but in his earlier writings, he's more inclined to interpret nothingness as either the invisible, uh, as he does in the 90s, or as some kind of passivity. And in his Conspectus from 1668-69, he prefers to understand nothingness as objective potency and even chaos. So he writes that, it, the origin of the first mind from God, educted from active potency, the origin of the first body from nothing, educted from objective potency, the origin of the world from chaos, and an explanation of the seven days. And this strange passage evokes a view that was common among many ancient philosophers, namely that there were in fact two creative principles, God and the pre-existent nature which he formed. And this makes God an architect uh, and not a creator in, in an absolute sense. So chaos, of course, is the Platonic principle of passivity, which is ordered into harmony by the demiurge. So it's lack of order and not as empty as nothingness should be. In the De Summa Rerum, there are no explicit denunciations of creation ex nihilo that I have found but there is evidence of creation out of the divine essence. So here are just two examples. 
Uh, he writes that the origin of things from God is of the same kind as the origin of properties from essence. And the variety of the world is nothing other than the same essence related in various ways. But the story is nicely summed up in one of his titles, um, uh, one of Leibniz's titles, where he writes uh, the origin of things from forms, not ex nihilo. The fourth and final trait that I have time to discuss uh, is one which helps us notice the peculiarity of the cosmogony of this period, I think. And that is that Leibniz toys with the idea of created creators at lower levels of reality. Christian Wildberg writes that for the Neoplatonists, reality emerged from the first incoherent stages in such a way that one stage functions as creative principle of the next. So in Plotinus, the one emanates and produces intellect, which again produces soul, which produces the world, etc. So it's not the one that creates the world, but soul. So soul is a created creator. And at first glance, this seems far removed from Leibniz's view. God is the cause of himself and thereby of all his modifications. But it gets more complicated for God causes the world by self-reflection and self-reflection is something all minds do. All minds reflect upon themselves and by so doing, they create little worlds around themselves. For self-reflection, creates a special concentric movement in matter that Leibniz calls a vortex, a whirlwind. He writes that the soul itself agitates a vortex. That is wonderful. But it does so, for we do not act as a simple machine, but out of reflection, that is, of action on ourselves. The whole world is one vortex for God. And there are as many minds or little worlds or perceptions as there are vortices in the world. So just as God um, ensures the law-like character of the cosmos, unifies it and, and makes it into a world, finite minds also make unity out of the infinitely divided chaos that is matter. So here one might object immediately that these two, creation and agitational vortices are different forms of causation. We do not produce ourselves. We only organize what already exists. But I think it's important to remember that God's production of himself cannot be a radical production out of nothing either. God is a necessary being and cannot not exist even logically. So God's production of himself must be understood as imminent causation where he reflects upon himself and so combines the infinitely varied forms, which Leibniz also calls perceptions, combines them to, to make the world. And similarly, perhaps, finite minds organize their perceptions, which also already exist, into more or less coherent worlds. So both create them in the sense of creation ex formis. And this could resemble, I think, the emanationist created creators performing a similar act at lower levels of reality. So these were just four emanationist traits that I think can be found in the Leibniz's writings. And there are other traits as well, uh, many of them from, from later in Leibniz's career that have been treated by, by other scholars. But I think um, it's equally important to mention the differences between the young Leibniz's cosmogony and typical emanationist systems. Firstly, Leibniz denies that there is an increasing distance between God and creature. And emanation implies such a distance since every new level of reality must be less unified and less divine than the previous. So there is a, a gradual waning of per perfection in a sense. And Leibniz can't allow that. So he writes in 1676 that what is earlier in this series of causes is not nearer to the reason for the universe, that is to the first being, uh, 
than what is later. Nor is the first being the reason for the later ones as a result of the mediation of the earlier ones. Rather, it is the reason for all of them equally immediately. So Leibniz does not allow that God should progressively lose his grip on, on creation, so to speak. But as you will have noticed, this passage contradicts not only that there is an increasing distance, but that the creation should be mediated. So this could be evidence against what I just suggested about the imminent creation that takes place at the level of finite minds. So I will just submit this piece of evidence for discussion. But secondly, a second difference that is more important is that Leibniz insists that God is a person and that God is a mind. And he considers this uh, intellectualized notion of personhood that he has to be perfectly compatible with the almost mechanistic uh, combinatorial origination account. Plotinus, as we know, uh, disliked all anthropomorphism and placed mind at a lower level below the original source. Uh, whereas for Leibniz, mind is primitive and the initial, the initial production or emanation, if you like, is already a form of thought. So those are important differences. And finally, I think God's personhood has consequences which counteract some of the emanationist tendencies in Leibniz, in the young Leibniz. For instance, uh, it's a fundamental aspect of Neoplatonist emanation that the higher levels of reality are unconcerned with their own results, their own sedimentations, and they certainly do not admire them. The lower levels are byproducts, they would say, of the self-perfecting activity and not products intended in themselves. So when I say that this does not apply even to the young Leibniz's God, many might object, and rightly, um, two things. Firstly, that in Leibniz as well, God's only activity is to reflect upon himself, and that therefore the resulting modes should be called by byproducts. It's, it's right to call them that. And secondly, one might object that God does not admire his creatures, but himself, that what he delights in is his own self-perception. So in both of these two aspects, Leibniz's God would resemble the inward looking first source of Plotinus. However, I think it's important to, to reply then that even in the De Summa Rerum, Leibniz insists that God wants the modifications so that they, they, they increase the perfection of the whole and God even aims for variegation. So he introduces this, this confusing element and also for this reason, Leibniz's God is more inclined to admire his creation than a Plotinian one could ever be. So the Plotinian hypostases are always turned back towards their unified sources. And admiration is always reserved for the higher unity. Whereas Leibniz's God explicitly uh, admires the multitude, the multitude of, of existence, as he writes. And in emanative systems, turning downwards is the source of sin and evil. So you would never find such a thing as admiration of multitudes in, in their systems. So to conclude then um, briefly, I believe it is justified to use the term emanation about the young Leibniz's cosmogony, and also that this term is more fruitful than one might think, uh, since it allows us to highlight some aspects of the young Leibniz's cosmogony that have received less attention. However, it's important to be careful and not immediately assume that the emanationism in question is neoplatonic. Firstly, because several of these traits that I've mentioned have counterparts in Christian theology, even something as radical as the idea of monism, or with where St. Paul is often cited as saying that everything is in God. But historically too, as, as this audience will know, the term emanation has been appropriated by Christian Platonists for centuries. Uh, and they did not think that faith and philosophy needed to be in conflict on this point. So I think in many ways, Leibniz belongs in this 
unparanoid tradition. For he seems to think that as long as God is a mind and a person and creation is a result of his thought, then the thought process itself can just as well be described in emanationist terms. So I will leave it there. Thank you very much. I have to unmute myself. Thank you so much. And you were perfectly on time. Uh, thank you for that. That was help. All right. Our next speaker is Paul Lodge um, from Oxford, talking about fiction, genealogy, and myth in Limitist the Odyssey. Thanks, Claudia. Um, I hope I can be as uh, well behaved in terms of time. So um, I'm going to talk about, well, I've given the title Fiction, Genealogy and Myth in Leibniz's The Odyssey. Uh, hopefully that will become clear what I'm getting at in a second. Uh, so let me introduce the talk to begin with. Um, the final paragraph of the preface to the Theodicy has... Um, the following beginning uh, line that says, um, I've endeavoured in all things to consider edification and, and I've conceded something to curiosity. It's because I thought it necessary to relieve a subject whose seriousness might cause discouragement. Um, and at that point, he mentions three things which are quite peculiar, really, um, each of which is discussed later. Um, he says he'll talk about the pleasing chimera of a certain astronomical theology, the ancient error of the two principles, which the Orientals distinguished by the names Oromazdes and Arimanius, and a small dialogue ending the essays. Now, some of these, the meaning of the, some of these is, is somewhat um, evident. So the second one is going to have something to do with cosmic dualism. But I'm interested in them because they, they all have kind of a, a rhetoric, which is certainly at odds with what many people would expect from uh, Leibniz's writings. So in the first one, for some reason, Leibniz presents this fiction, which is not a fiction that he himself is responsible for. In the second one, um, what we find is a kind of genealogy, and I'm, I'm interested in why that's there and what it's doing. And then the third one is, um, is well known, but at the end of the Odyssey, Leibniz presents a dialogue which implies uh, mythological and historical characters. Um, so I, I don't have a thesis as such. I just want to run over them and, and individually. And um, the fact that they're mentioned together and they're all peculiar is what gives me my excuse to talk about them. I find them that they're all things about which I would enjoy thinking and potentially writing more. Um, so I want to begin with the astronomical theology. Um, so in section 18 of part one of the theology, Leibniz observes, there is a man of wit who pushing my principle of harmony even to arbitrary suppositions that I in no wise approve has created for himself a theology well known, well nigh astronomical. And then he describes this, this um, astronomical theology. It's a complex Baroque kind of system. Um, it's broadly Christian and it um, basically it describes the emergence it's an account of, or oh, Leibniz is focusing on the way in which, which it accounts for sin in the world, and it's supposed to be an angel presiding over the earth, which is was at one point a star, which is responsible for this. And it, the narrative includes an apocalypse, and that involves universal salvation through the mediation of Jesus Christ, who is also identified with um, Adam Cadmon as well. Uh, Leibniz didn't write this, but he seems to have associated it, or it seems to have been associated with him. I haven't been able to find out who the author was. Um, the, the French edition of the Theodicy with all of its footnotes doesn't attribute it to anybody in particular. Um, what's this doing? Why is it there? Um, well, it occurs in the context where Leibniz is discussing or introducing at least, and then briefly discussing what he thinks about eternal damnation and its relevance for, broadly speaking, the problem of evil, um, where he understands by that the established doctrine that the number of men damned eternally will be incomparably greater than that of the saved. Um, in fact, sorry, I'm struggling to see this bit at the top because of the screen. Um, uh, anyway, I can't quite see what it says at the top, but basically 
what Leibniz has done um, prior to introducing the astronomical theology is, has listed three um, eschatological accounts. Um, one of them is the view that the the number of wicked uh, will that will be damned would be very small, which contrasts the very large number in the orthodox view, and he attributes that to Prudentius and Gregory of Nyssa. Uh, a second opinion is that one where all the Christians get saved, um, which uh, is attributed to St. Jerome, and what he says is a, a saying of St. Paul, which he himself gives out as mysterious, stating that all Israel will be saved. Um, and then finally, um, sorry, it's not moving. Uh, there we go. The, um, essentially the universalist view where not just Christians, but everybody gets saved, including the bad angels. And he attributes that to origin um, and then a more contemporary author, Johann Wilhelm Peterson, um, and sort of associates with Jean Leclerc, who's relevant because Leclerc and Bale are, are in the background for the entire theodicy. Um, so those views are, views are just presented. Um, and then kind of you wonder what's going on here. So you've got these three views, you've got the astronomical theology, and then also it's in the context of Leibniz discussing eternal damnation. The three views are just there. Leibniz doesn't say anything about them. He doesn't say that any of the views are his own. Um, the astronomical theology, however, is rejected quite firmly. Um, and so one might think, given that it's got a universalist component, that at least that's what you know Leibniz is rejecting universalism. Um, but it doesn't seem really that that's the case because the grounds for rejecting it are specific to the the strange nature of this uh, this theology. And he says, we don't need such hypotheses or fictions. And he suggests that it, it it's wit. It's, there doesn't seem to be any revelation here. It just seems to be a clever fiction. Um, and then more importantly, he thinks that he says, even reason cannot turn it to, a, turn to it, it to account, I think that should say. Um, and the, the real issue here seems to be that he thinks that the more fantastical elements in the theology, such as this description of the angel residing in the earth, which was a star, are just empirically refuted by the best account of the way that things are in, in the actual cosmos. Um, so it, it's hard to know what's going on here. And it's, it is quite peculiar um, because what happens afterwards is that Leibniz actually then quickly turns to um, a discussion of eternal damnation he says holding then to the established doctrine and that's then the doctrine that he tries to um, manage in the context of um, the compatibility of god and evil um so i think what you've got is this peculiar um you know leibniz in introducing these views which are broadly more uh sympathetic than the eternal damnation view um doesn't really need to introduce any of them at all at this point. And there's a kind of ambivalence about which view is correct. Um, so I just speculate that it's, you know, what we've got here is Leibniz putting lots of views on the table, um, none of which he firmly endorses. And I've argued elsewhere that one might be able to construct the idea that he's really not so bothered about um, which one of these is true, and perhaps even that he thinks pragmatic considerations might lead one to um, adopt one rather than another in when one's um, discussing the issues with particular people. So, yeah, that's the first one. The second one is the ancient error of the two principles. Um, the doctrine of the two principles, um, uh, this appears in section 136, part two, so we're leaping forward quite a bit. Um, and here, it's presented mainly as a, as a direct response to Bell's suggestion that the existence of evil is best explained by the existence of a principle of evil that's co-equal to God. Um, it's associated with Manai and the Paulicians in Bale's dictionary. Um, and and that's there are lots of quotes that Leibniz uses in association with those um, bits of the dictionary. Uh, so Leibniz attacks the doctrine at this point. There's quite an extended discussion of this doctrine in three main ways. Um, in sections 145 to 51, he offers a number of what I'll call his theodicies. I'm using that in the planting sense of the word. So they are attempts to explain why the, the universe has the structure that it does, not just attempts to make 
to show that it's possible that God exists given the nature of the universe. So he introduced a number of those. And in sections 152 and 153, um, perhaps more interesting because this seems to be novel, he argues that the, the principle doesn't do the kind of explanatory work that Bale claims it does. So it, it doesn't really help Leibniz claims. Um, both of those seem to attack the legitimacy of the doctrine understood as, as a bit of natural theology. And a lot of the theodicy, if not most of the theodicy, seems to be an exercise in natural theology. Um, but these earlier sections um, correspond to what's advertised at the end of the preface. And this consists of a genealogy of the names that are attributed to Zoroaster um, when he gives his cosmic... Oh, putatively gives his cosmic dualist um, ontology, um, who's said to have called one god Oromazes, or rather Oromazdes, and the, the, the good one and the evil god Arimadius. Um, then what Leibniz does, and it's quite complex, is gives the genealogy of these names, and he argues on linguistic grounds that he says it's probable that these were the names of two great contemporary princes, the one monarch of a part of Upper Asia, where they've been since others of this same name, the other king of the Scythian Celts, who made incursions into the states of the former and who was also named amongst the divinities of Germania. Um, there's more that he says about that point, but the, the key thought seems to be that these, these two princes have been fighting. One of them, you know, where the doctrine arises, um, one of them counts as the good prince, the other one counts as the bad prince, and that morphs into a mythology of there being two principles, one good and evil, vying with each other, um, and th that this is supposed to somehow be where the names came from, and perhaps even where the very idea of cosmic dualism comes from in the first place. Um, so I want to think of that genealogy as having a, a an interesting place, so I think of it as a critical genealogy. So along with other remarks that Leibniz makes about sources which are supposed to testify to Zoroaster, in fact, maybe have been maybe having been a monotheist, um, it seems to undermine the thought that the existence of this doctrine emerges from a distinct form of, or is a distinct form of revealed religion. There's a kind of natural explanation of why people would have thought that there were two um, co-evil principles vying for um, the, the kind of positively and negatively to control um, the world as experienced by the people in it. Um, and interestingly, this then contrasts with another genealogy that we find in the Theodicy, because right at the beginning, we get what we might call a vindicatory genealogy of Christianity, where Lannis is saying something that kind of supports the idea that this is um, a, a, an acceptable revealed religion, one which chimes with um, his natural theology. Uh, it's got minimal doctrinal commitments, just monotheism plus immortality, which is interesting in, in itself. Um, but it's said to go all the way back to uh, Moses and possibly it said, he says it was known by other wise people and later it's presented by Muhammad as well. Um, the monotheism is said to be explicitly in Judaism, but Leibniz also suggests that there was an esoteric commitment to, to the immortality of the soul. And then Jesus's job or Jesus's success arises from having got everybody to kind of buy into the view um, rather than being uh, the incarnation in this particular discussion. So there we've got this kind of interesting way of, um, yeah, I mean, I think people perhaps associate this kind of critical genealogy with Hume as being one of the first people in the modern period, at least. So I think it's it's both interesting that Leibniz is doing that um, from a kind of, from that perspective, but also just it's interesting to see this kind of different kind of rhetoric. Um, and finally, I want to talk, turn to the, the small dialogue, which may be more familiar to people. Um, so the um, this appears right at the end of the Theodicy proper, so part three, uh, sections 405 to 17. Then there are various appendices, but this is the end of the, the book. Uh, Leibniz first presents an abridgment of Lorenzo Valla's dialogue on free will, uh, which argues for the compatibility of divine foreknowledge and free will. And then Leibniz continues the dialogue where Valor breaks off in order to make some of his own views now. Um, why does Leibniz include the dialogue? Well, he says 
not a lot about this. Um, in the preface, he says it will um, give some satisfaction to those who are well pleased to see difficult but important truths set forth in an easy and familiar way. And then just before he discusses it, he says, um, in order to explain myself toward the end of my dissertation as clearly as I can, and in a way most likely to be generally understood, I'm going to give you this dialogue. Both of these are slightly odd, given that what what we then get is a fiction, which is not straightforwardly a description of anything uh, that's supposed to really exist. Um, there's more, I think, much more, I think, that could be said about just why it has this kind of structure. Um, I don't have too much about that I'm going to say about that today. Um, let me quickly go over what's in Valor's dialogue. Um, at least Leibniz's summary of it. Um, so Leibniz presents Valor, and I think this is fine, as arguing that divine foreknowledge and freedom are compatible, but that um, he cannot explain, or, or, or perhaps we we in general cannot explain, why um, a given person freely chooses to do evil, uh, and particularly why God would have created people with that, that free capacity to, to choose evil. Um, so what does Valor do? Uh, well, he employs, um, and again, I'm struggling to see the top of the slide, I'm afraid, um, the sort of traditional story about, um, about Sextus Tarquinius, um, and he's supposed to have been the last of the Roman kings whose rape of his sister-in-law, Lucretia, um, leads to his fall from grace and then the, the founding of the Roman Republic. Um, so in this particular story, um, Valor presents Sextus as consulting Apollo, who represents divine foreknowledge, um, to find out what's going to happen and, and having his fate, his terrible fate predicted. Um, Sextus claiming he's going to do otherwise, um, but Apollo insisting that that's just not possible because he can see what's going to happen. Um, and Valor observes that this has got nothing to do with Apollo because Apollo is just uh, just has foreknowledge, um, but rather it's the divine will that's responsible for the fact that Sextus um, has an evil nature. Um, and since Valor's only really set himself the task of explaining why foreknowledge is not a problem, um, he doesn't deal with this. Um, and Sextus is kind of, uh, yeah, is obviously frustrated in this case, um, wondering why he deserves to receive the punishment. And Valor's answer is just, I didn't say that I was going to um, solve that problem. Um, and then something that Leibniz doesn't like, um, he says, we do not know the reasons which he may have for this, but since he's very good and very wise, that's enough to make us deem that his reasons are good. So this simple refusal to engage with any kind of explanation for why um, God creates free beings who nonetheless freely will to sin or freely will in such a way that they commit sin is something that Leibniz thinks is not is not acceptable. So he continues his dialogue. Um, he says it's excellent, but the chief defect is it cuts the knot. It seems to condemn providence under the name of Jupiter, almost making him the author of sin. And then we get the little fable. What happens in Leibniz's version is that Sextus um, is um, seeks out Jupiter, um, as and Jupiter is presented as as um, speaking via another oracle um, and. He um, is told at that point um, that um, he just won't do what he needs to do. So Sextus is told you need to do X, Y, and Z, uh, but you're not going to do that. And lo and behold, that's what happens. Um, so there's a little bit which isn't really going beyond Valor. And then Leibniz introduces a new character, Theodorus, the high priest. And he comes in and starts talking to Jupiter. Um, and he says... Your faithful worshippers are astonished. They would fain wonder at your goodness as well as your greatness. It rested with you to give Sextus a different will. So this is, yeah, this this third person perspective um, is introduced. And there's a question about why God didn't create Sextus such that he freely chose not to sin. Uh, Jupiter says, well, you're going to have to go talk to Pallas about this. Um, and that's precisely what Theodorus does. Um, he goes to Athens and then, interestingly, falls asleep in the temple. 
And we're told he's transported to an unknown country where there's a palace of unimaginable splendor and prodigious size. Palace appears at the gate, surrounded by rays of dazzling majesty. Then after he's already asleep, he has to be touched by an olive branch so that he can cope with palace's divine radiancy and what she'll show him. She leads him on a tour of halls within the palace some of this might be familiar to you, each of which is the determinate representation of a possible world. And they form a pyramid such that, quote, they're more beautiful as one mounted towards the apex. And there is an apex, crucially. Um, so they reach the top um, and then Theodorus is led into the palace at the top. And we're told that he became entranced. Um, uh, again, I'm struggling to see all of this because of the, the way that the um, program is covering up the text. But um, yeah, he goes into an ecstasy and then he has to, again, receive this strange kind of you know intervention from Pallas. He gets sucker, a divine liquid is placed on his tongue. Then he can cope again and he's beside himself with joy. And at that point, Pallas tells Theodorus um, that he's in the actual world. Um, and in addition to this, um, says that Jupiter could not have failed to choose this world, which surpasses in perfection all the others, and which forms the apex of the pyramid, else Jupiter would have renounced his wisdom. He would have banished me, his daughter. You see that my father did not make Sextus wicked. He was so from all eternity. He was so always and freely. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's the, the revelation that he gets. And then, interestingly, um, he is um, told that um, this is something that eventually, after he's passed from a mortal state, he'll be able to have access to, um, you know, in, in this higher state. So the suggestion is that although he's got a glimpse of it under these strange, strange conditions, it will be available um, subsequently in a more... Um, yeah, more lasting way God will have given, or the gods as it is here, will have given him what he needs to cope with it without all this kind of extra help. Then Theodorus wakes up because this has all been a dream, of course. Um, he thanks the goddess and then he owns the justice of Jupiter. Um, I guess that means he kind of commits to this idea. And then his spirit is pervaded by this and he goes on and he carries out the office of the high priest with all the zeal of a true servant of God. And essentially, it seems to be the case that he lives this joyous kind of as happy a life as a mortal is capable of. And I guess it's not said explicitly, but we assume that he's doing good works as well. Um, now, there's lots going on there that one could talk about. Um, I just want to draw attention to one thing that I think is interesting. Or that I'm, um, What seems to be happening, among other things, crucially, is that this fable is one where the protagonist comes to believe and really internalise the claim that this the actual world is the best of all possible worlds. We've already had an argument for this in section eight of part one, a kind of a bit of natural theology. It's supposed to follow from the existence of a perfect creator, which in turn has been proved using a version of the cosmological argument. But what happens here is that you've got the same thesis becoming a matter of divine revelation. Um, palace represents one of the divine attributes. So personal revelation in a dream is what gives rise to the commitment. And it's with this kind of vivid uh, representation of the view that, that Theodorus is able to go forward and live out his life um, in accordance with it. So who is Theodorus? And this is the thing, I mean, this, this is very speculative now, but um, this is what got me kind of particularly intrigued. Um, and there are lots of Theodoruses, but one of the most obvious ones, I think, when you look through them, is that it, Theodorus is um, the character who appears in Plato's dialogues, Theotetus, Sophists, and Statesmen. And in particular, that character is the fifth century geometer who is supposed to be Theotetus' teacher, who's famous for the spiral of Theodorus, which is a, a, a early you know, piece of Greek mathematics, which has to do with um, kind of... Uh, Kind of limit series um and so it struck me a while ago that this this character is um i mean it's not that you know you can do a strict identification but some of the things that that, that theodorus is known for seem to have some kind of affinity with the kind of um 
mathematical intuition that um, feeds into Leibniz's account of contingency um, when he's giving his famous formal account of contingency. Um, so, yeah, this is a leap, but I want to suggest maybe we're supposed to think of Theodorus as Leibniz himself and that the dialogue is in some sense a veiled description of Leibniz's own sense of having experienced the actual world in such a way that it might be characterized as, you know, as good as things could possibly have been. So he then be is the high priest of the best of all possible worlds. Um, he has this witness testimony, which is also borne out by a life which is invigorated by this belief. Um, and so what we're getting, although it's, you know, interestingly then hedged as occurring in a dream, and it requires that the content of the dream be owned or appropriated on awakening. Um, but I want to suggest that in some sense, we're at least getting the report of the possibility of having not just an argument for the best of all possible worlds, but some kind of personal revelation of the applicability of that concept to the actual world. Um, and that's where I'm going to finish. Uh, I can't see just how long I took, but hopefully it wasn't much more than 20 minutes. No, it was great. Thank you so much. No, thank you. All right. So um, our last talk of uh, today will be um, Henry Strong from uh, Yale talking about Leibniz's salvific response to the complaint of the damned. Thank you. Paul, could you stop sharing your screen, please? Yeah, that's it. I think you could have shared over the top of me, but there we go. I could, um, but yeah. Um, okay. Okay, hopefully that's okay. Uh, yes, so in my talk, uh, I'm going to discuss Leibniz's conception of damnation and his defense of damnation's compatibility with God's love for everyone. I also intend to touch on how Leibniz's engagement with the problems surrounding damnation exemplifies the pragmatic motivations of his philosophical theology. Um, yeah, so in short, I'm going to argue that Leibniz's theory of damnation and salvation is also a theory of misery and happiness in general, and that Leibniz's engagement with damnation is intended as a therapeutic to alleviate anxieties about the justice or injustice of the world, anxieties which prevent the emergence of the love of God or piety, which is for Leibniz the heart of wisdom. In particular, I'm going to examine Leibniz's response to what he calls the complaint of the damned. This is the damned's complaint that God created them such that their misery was inevitable. In doing so, I will explore Leibniz's psychology of damnation, which forms a central element of his justification of damnation. In short, Leibniz argues that damnation is compatible with God's justice because the damned will their own damnation. They will their own damnation because they take pleasure in harmonizing their experience into a coherent worldview, which justifies their resentment. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to focus almost exclusively on Leibniz's Confessio Philosophi, or the Confession of a Philosopher, since it contains Leibniz's richest discussion of damnation. The Confessio is a very early text. It was probably written between late 1672 and early 1673, and it takes the form of a catechism between a theologian, a catechist, and a philosopher, a catechumen, with the theologian pressing the philosopher to defend God's justice in the face of evil. So let me begin by outlining uh, the so-called complaint of the damned. This is the complaint, Leibniz writes, that they were born in such a way, sent into the world in such a way, came upon such times, persons and occasions that they were not able not to perish. Their minds occupied prematurely by vicious thoughts existed in circumstances that favored evil, that stimulated evil, they lack circumstances that would have released them, that would have restrained them, as if the fates conspired in the ruin of the wretched. The complaint is that God has treated them unjustly by creating them with such a character and putting them in such circumstances that damnation was inevitable for them. As a theologian asked the philosopher, I quote, if God is delighted by the happiness of everyone, why did he not make everyone happy? If he loves everyone, how is it that he damns so many? If he is just, how is it that he presents himself as so unfair that from matter that is the same in every respect, from the same clay, he brings forth some vessels intended for honor, others intended for disgrace? Crucially, for my argument, answering the complaint of a damned has deep pragmatic significance for Leibniz, 
since he believes that to doubt God's justice, his wise love for every person, is itself to risk damnation. Leibniz writes in the Confessio that just as God harms only those by whom he is feared in a servile way, that is, who presume he will harm them, so on the other hand, whoever firmly believes himself to be elected, that is, dear to God, he, because he firmly loves God, brings it about that he's elected and is saved. For Leibniz, to love God and to understand and sincerely believe that one is loved by God is to be saved, while to believe that God does not love all his creatures, that is, to take seriously the complaint of the damned, obstructs salvation. So according to Leibniz, doubt about the world's injustice, or doubts about the world's justice even, incites fear and prevents us from loving God. Indeed, Leibniz argues that those, and this quote, who purport to find an argument for atheism based on the assumed disorder of things, for instance, on the putative injustice of damnation, are haters of God, and so are damned. To put it differently, and in more contemporary terms, this means that to take seriously the problem of evil as evidence against the existence of God itself risks damnation. Hence, I suggest, Leibniz's writing uh, in the Confessio and elsewhere has salvific intent in demonstrating God's love for every being, which in turn produces love of God or piety, which is the highest mode of wisdom. To make sense of these somewhat surprising claims, or I think somewhat surprising, I'm first going to elucidate Leibniz's conception of damnation, what he means by damnation. A central feature of Leibniz's understanding of damnation is that the punishment of damnation is a direct psychological result of the sin which merits it. For Leibniz, hatred of God suffices for damnation in the sense that the state of hating God is psychologically sufficient for the state of damnation. This is because, Leibniz writes, from hatred of God, that is, of the most happy being, the greatest sadness follows. For just as to love is to be delighted by happiness, similarly to hate is to be saddened by happiness, therefore the greatest sadness arises from hatred of the greatest happiness. The greatest sadness is misery or damnation. Damnation or misery does not involve some extra punishment or torment that is inflicted from the outside, but rather is the natural result of hatred. To understand clearly what Leibniz means by the hatred of God, it is useful and important to note that according to Leibniz, one not need believe in God or even have a conscious idea of God to hate God in the relevant sense. For Leibniz, hating the world or hating others amounts or can amount to hating God. As he writes from the Confessio, someone who does not know God can nonetheless hate him. Thus, whoever hates nature, the present state of things, the world hates God. Hatred involves being miserable at the happiness or perfection of the hated. And so damnation just is the misery that arises from living with a hateful relation to the world. In damnation, crime and punishment are one. This conception of damnation is well exemplified by Leibniz's discussion of Judas Iscariot. In response to the theologian's question of why Judas was damned, the philosopher gives the following reply, and I quote, because he knew that he had rebelled and he believed that God was a tyrant. He knew that he had lapsed and he believed that God would not forgive. He knew that he was guilty and he believed that God was cruel. He knew that he was wretched and he believed that God was unjust. He knew that he had sinned and he believed that God would punish him. Crucial in this passage is a distinction between knowing and believing or skio and credo. Skio is used to refer to Judas's knowledge of his own sins, while credo refers to Judas's false belief in God's hatred towards him. The distinction between Scio and Credo implies that Judas's belief that God would punish him is false, just as his beliefs that God is cruel, unforgiving, and a tyrant are false. The implication is, therefore, that God does not want to punish Judas, and therefore Judas's punishment does not come from God. Rather, Judas's damnation consists in the despair that arises from his knowledge of his sins, combined with his false belief that God hates him for his sins a belief which in turn causes Judas to resent God. Judas does not need devils with pitchforks because he punishes himself, himself through his own hatred. 
There is then no suggestion in the Confessio that the post-mortem state of the damned is qualitatively, qualitatively different from earthly misery. In the Confessio, Leibniz claims that there are people living on earth who are currently damnable, and then proceeds to collapse the distinction between the damned and the damnable, writing that at no time is a damned individual damned for all eternity, but rather they are always damnable. As I said, for Leibniz, damnation is just the misery that arises from hatred. And so, although it's not really religiously appropriate to use the language of damnation to talk about living individuals, given that it is possible to hate God during one's earthly existence, it is possible to experience damnation in the here and now. Hell, like heaven, is a place on earth. Indeed, there is no real space within Leibniz's conception of damnation for an orthodox conception of the Day of Judgment. Since Leibniz insists, as I said, that at no time are the damned henceforth damned for all eternity. This is because, he writes, no one remains damned unless he continues to damn himself. The damned are never damned absolutely. They are always worthy of damnation. There is no point in time at which individuals are subject to a final judgment and nor can anyone know whether they will be damned forever. Answering the complaint of the damned is pressing for Leibniz, not only for securing salvation after death, but also, as I suggested, in seeking to alleviate misery and create happiness in this life. The shape of his answer is apt for this role. Since Leibniz answers the complaint by demonstrating that it was, is within the damned power to end their own damnation. And for this reason, Leibniz claims that the complaint of the damned cannot in fact be coherently made because he writes, the damned are always able to be set free, but they never will it. And so they cannot ever even consistently complain without contradiction. He goes on that the damned are never damned in such a fashion that they could not stop being worthy of damnation if they willed it. They are always damning themselves anew. Damned then must in some sense desire their own damnation, although of course they may not desire it under that description. And so it makes no sense then to complain about it. If the damned will to end their damnation, then they are free to do so. Since damnation arises from the hatred of God, to complain to God about being damned would be to complain about being created such that one has a hateful will. But this would be to recognize that one's hateful will is a source of one's misery and that one would be better off without it. One would thus be motivated to end one's hatred and therefore would no longer be damned or damnable. This naturally raises the question, why would anyone choose damnation? Surely no sane individual could desire damnation in the way Leibniz suggests. And if this is so, the Leibniz's response to the complaint risks seeming somewhat flimsy. If the damned are genuinely free, then they will surely not choose hell. And if the damned are not free, then the damnation must be unjust. Leibniz's solution to this problem is found in the psychology of the damned that he prevents, presents in the Confessio, where he purports to show how and why someone would freely will damnation. And it's worth quoting at length. But pain in some way is transformed into pleasure and these wretched ones rejoice at finding something by which they are tormented. Just as among human beings too, those who are unhappy while envying those who are happy, seek to criticize them with no other outcome than that they become incensed because According to their point of view, those who are so inept are in control of matters, and thus their pain, more uncontrolled and unrestrained, is turned into a kind of harmony, i.e. a semblance of reason. For in the case of the envious, the indignant, and the malcontent of this kind, pleasure is mixed with pain in a strange way, for that just as they are pleased and delighted by their belief in their own wisdom, so they suffer that much more uncontrollably, because they lack the power which they believe is due to them and which they believe is possessed by those, by others who are unworthy. They are damned by such a panacity, such a perversion of appetite, such an aversion to God, that they enjoy nothing more than having something for which they suffer, and they seek nothing more than to discover a reason to be angry. So Leibniz argues that damned gain pleasure from the damnation which is the source of their motivation. And while numerous psychological phenomena are indicated in the dense passage I just quoted, 
The central idea of the passage, I think, is that the pain of the damned is turned into a kind of harmony. At the beginning of the Confessio, Leibniz writes that to be delighted is to experience harmony. And this is the definition Leibniz will retain in some form for the rest of his life. Pleasure is the experience of harmony. Since the damned take pleasure in their damnation, they must experience some kind of harmony in their suffering. And the idea I suggest is the following. The damned have developed certain resentful sentiments towards the world, such as disdain, indignation, envy, and disapproval, due to the way in which the world has resisted their will and fallen short of their conception of how it ought to be. As such, they have developed a conception of the world as flawed and unfair. As rational beings, they have sought to explain this flawedness, this gap between the world and their conception of how it ought to be, and have come to blame the flawedness of the world on the imperfection of God, and thus have explained a diversity of suffering through a single cause, God's imperfection. Such conceptualizing is a form of intellectual activity, which itself is a kind of harmonizing. The damned explain the existence of suffering, in particular their own suffering, by positing that those who are so inept are in control of matters. As such, the damned create a false, but seemingly explanatorily powerful picture of the world as flawed due to the imperfection of its rulers. They take pleasure in their intellectual activity. That is, their harmonizing experience into a coherent worldview. It is this pleasure which motivates them to continue their damnation. An important aspect of this is the way in which the damned confirm their own beliefs and intellect. Leibniz writes that they, by the damned, are pleased and delighted by their belief in their own wisdom. The damned view themselves as the ones who are enlightened, for they understand the corruption of the world and the ineptness of its creator. Hence, they seek out they seek out further evidence of the world's failings and take pleasure in perceiving such failings, since such evidence confirms their own worldview and wisdom. As a result, Leibniz thinks that resentment is typically self-perpetuated. There is a certain pleasure to be found in complaining about the way things are, which further drives one's discontent, which in turn causes one to seek out and perceive more aspects to complain about, which drives the cycle of pleasurable dissatisfaction. Indeed, I think the most striking claim in the long passage I quoted is that the damned enjoy nothing more than having something for which they suffer. They enjoy their suffering because it proves them right, provides them further material to harmonize into their worldview. The damned hate the world and believe it is the creation of an unjust God. They themselves are proof of that injustice. Their damnation, their alienation from God is proof of God's cruelty. Their lives are living evidence of the problem of evil. Each further reason to be angry is proof of their wisdom and God's stupidity. They are thus driven to alienate themselves further from God so as to prove the truth of their worldview. The pleasure of damnation derives from the rational activity of the damned in conceptualizing their suffering as a result of the failures of God. It is not an absence of reason. Leibniz insists that the damned use their reason in a sane way. They're not insane. Rather, he writes, in the case of fools and evildoers, reason is perverted by reason of another kind. A lesser reason perverts the greater reason. A certain particular reason, fixed in the mind by temperament, education, and use, perverts universal reason. Universal reason. So, to conclude, I would like to again draw attention to the way in which this points to the salvific need for Leibniz to respond to the complaint of the damned. As I mentioned at the beginning, Leibniz claimed that those who purport to find an argument for atheism based on the assumed disorder of things are haters of God. Take the existence of suffering as proof that God is either unjust, unwise, or non-existent, is itself to risk damnation. This is not because such discontent deserves retributive punishment, but rather because such discontent, such belief in the fundamental brokenness of the world, is a natural cause of suffering and misery. Indeed, it is precisely fear of divine retribution that Leibniz thinks we must overcome, writing in a margin of the manuscript of the Confessio that whoever fears God in a servile way does not love him, and to that extent is not yet in a state of grace. Therefore, one is not led in that way, i.e. by fear, to salvation. Leibniz thinks happiness is found not through fear of divine wrath, 
but rather in trusting that God will take care of things. His response to the complaint of the damned is thus, I suggest, an exemplar of the pragmatic orientation of his philosophical theology. Leibniz seeks to remove the anxieties about God's injustice, which can prevent us from developing piety or the love of God. Such piety is, for Leibniz, the heart of wisdom, since, as he later writes in The Principles of Nature and Grace, God being the most perfect and happiest substance, and consequently the most lovable, and pure genuine love consisting in the state which makes us take pleasure in the perfections and in the happiness of the one we love, this love must give us the greatest pleasure of which we are capable when God is its object. Thank you. That's all. Great. Thank you very much. All right. So uh, now we have plenty of time for questions. Um, I please like raise your hand or like leave a comment in the chat. I think we already have someone. Daniel uh, Cook announced that he has a comment. Okay, can I unmute myself? Do you yeah, hear me? We, we can hear you. Good. I wanted just to mention another aspect of what both two of the speakers talked about, Leibniz's pragmatism. Uh, he quotes the Bible, of course, Matthew, by your fruits, you shall know them. And this is in the area of the enthusiasts and millenarians and Schwermerai that populated the, the period and he lived in, uh, in many different countries. And he was especially struck by the excitement occasioned by Rosamine Asseberg in his own area and the court elsewhere was all excited. And uh, his attitude was basically, as long as they didn't uh, disturb the public order or do anything to upset the established order, uh, let them believe what they believe. Part of the banter in the court, this ironic type of speaking showed this. And at the end, he said of Rosa de Asenberg, no, she's an aristocrat. She isn't going to bring any problems. So just treat her as a fine cabinet piece. In other words, that, and so I think here also his attitude in, in this area was also very pragmatic. Thank you. Thank you. Does um, anyone want to say anything to that? Or if not, we can uh, move on to Dan Garber who has a question. Well, I was going to yeah. to, to Del I mean, I, I'm very yeah. sympathetic to what Dan's saying. I mean, the, the, yeah, certainly with the universalist stuff, part of the argument is that these, it doesn't really matter. Um, and he's very tolerant, as as Dan says, of other people as well. Van Holmont is somebody who he thinks is is much more, you know, he says crazy things, but he much yeah, prefers yeah. Van Holmont to so all these other yeah. people like Spinoza because they say things that well, produce the, what Henry's talking about, a failure to love the world. And so I think all of these positive um, soteriologies, he's he's reasonably happy with as long as they actually produce an increase in that kind of love of world and then uh, the kind of yeah ethical demeanor that goes along with that. And he's trying to promote in whatever context he's in, the one which is most likely to to engender that um, and that's going to vary very much between context and then for me there's a question of whether any of them really count as a story which Leibniz thought one would tell to the most enlightened people and that would be a true story or whether there's never any such thing as the true story um, and that the I mean what I'm gesturing to at the end of my piece is that it's more about there being a state of mind which one can inhabit which perhaps exceeds one's ability to really tell a story which is supposed to be a literally true story of the way things are. But I'm just gesturing at that, of course. But basically, yeah, I'm very sympathetic to, to Dan's interpretation of all this. Great. Um, Henry, do you want to weigh in on this? or? Um, not especially. Um... Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it, it just remind, it struck me. Yeah, if Paul's right, and that would um, would really be a way in which uh, I guess Leibniz is a Lutheran. Um, I suppose in Luther's position, I was thinking that one of the will is that trusting God in a kind of second person way is the primary. Yeah, the primary, I suppose, element of faith, 
Um, and that's kind of, you know, that's really all you need. And then reason only plays a secondary function in bringing you back to that. Um, but yeah, that's really what I have to say. Great. Um, Dan? Well, uh, Dan Garber, I think, I mean. Thank you, thank you. Um, You've uh, Dan, you've muted yourself. Sorry, I thought that I had unmuted. Okay. Uh, I want to thank all three of you for really interesting presentations. Aspects of uh, uh, Leibniz's thought that um, that I really hadn't given a lot of thought to, but I would like to uh, ask a question to uh, 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 Esne and uh, and to Henry. Um, the young Leibniz, um, as you've, you've, you've argued, is, um, has a sort of neoplatonic conception um, of God. And um, the passages that you gave are certainly um, extremely um, convincing about that. Um, and that's, that conception of God seems to be quite radically different from the conception that one has of God in the mature life, where God is an agent who actually chooses to create the best of all possible worlds, um, altogether different, certainly not emanationist in the sense in which you're, doing, you're, you're um, talking about him. And I'm wondering um, when you think he changed and why. But this is connected with some of the things that Henry was talking about, about the confessio. The confessio, if I remember correctly, and I haven't really looked at it um, you know, in um, a long time. Uh, the first draft of the confessio is 1672. Is that, is that right? Um, and um, as I remember, the, the um, sort of, solution of the problem of evil that um, he proposes there isn't exactly what it is that we get later in the, uh, the Odyssey, which is, of course, at the end of Leibniz's life. But do you see in the conception of God in uh, 1672 with the Confessio the kind of um, Neoplatonic conception of God that Esne um, um, sees in some of these other earlier Paris period writings? Okay, uh, I, I, can, I can start maybe, Henry, and you can jump in. Um, thank you for that question. Uh, it's a great one and a very difficult, broad one <laughs> to, to answer, but um, I think, as I, as I mentioned, there will be tensions throughout this period. So there are passages where he's very um, more orthodox, perhaps, if you can say that. And he talks about God's choosing. And even in the De Summa Rerum, there are passages like that. God acting for the best, he writes. And uh, so that's just a, that's just on a side note. But I think, um, I think that there is a tension in the early writings uh, between what he when he's he's nascent metaphysics and the the theological commitments that he seems to take for granted like in 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 the confessio for instance he he uses god's will uh, uh, to for his theodicy uh, the, the will is important it has to be outside it has to be uh, it, 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 it yeah, has to be free of mean. guilt exactly so the, the divine will will figure is very prominently but it doesn't and that's that's the tension that is so interesting he doesn't really have a place for it in his metaphysics even in the confessio he talks about um the the world coming into being through intellection and he sort of he thought, talks about creative intellection so it seems to me um that he's he's sort of he's coming back to this this puzzle that he wasn't quite able to solve maybe or interested in solving even in the confessio in the De Summa Rerum, where he he uses this uh, spinozan toolkit that he's got from Chernhaus to to see if he can articulate the create the creative thinking process that 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 is at the uh, in, source of being before Henry comes in can I can I ask sort of a, a little follow-up on that um, yeah. 
I think some of the some of the passages that you were citing um, were earlier than 75, 76, which is when it is that Leibniz might have been exposed to Spinoza to Chernhaus. Um, so if that's the case, his sort of neo-Platonic emanationism would have come earlier than his um, um, exposure to Spinoza, if indeed he was exposed to the 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 um, uh, Spinoza's metaphysics that early, where might it have come from? That's a a question I've I've been trying really hard to answer historically, and I I, I don't. I won't claim to have a solution to it. It can come from many places. There is a, yeah. he read German mystics. <laughs> uh, so that, that might be a, a source. Um, and yeah. of course, Plato, I mean. Uh, yeah, the, the, but, but, but his main education, I mean, his main teacher was Jakob Tumasius, yeah. who was um, certainly well, well, a complicated character, but, but himself something of an Aristotelian. Definitely, right. yeah. Um, something about it was clear. He, I mean, his Aristotelianism was complicated. He distinguished the historical Aristotle from the scholastic Aristotle, but certainly was a supporter of teaching the um, scholastic Aristotle in school. Is there, are there in, in any of the letters between Leibniz and Timasius, do any of the um, hints of this Sort of Neoplatonism um, come up. Oh, I'm I'm not sure if I know. I mean, I'm sure there are people here who know the letters better than I do. I'm I'm not sure. I don't. I haven't found it. In that case, I I hope I will. <laughs> there's, but there's, no. there's a really nice edition, uh, French and Latin, by um, and I'm blocking uh, blocking his name um, with with a really nice introduction as well. Uh, that was published, I think, about 1990. I can send you. I can send you a reference. Thank you. Um, that would be if you're, if you're interested. So that's that that's a very accessible way of sort of getting all of that um, exchange and 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 a uh, digestible form. Thank you. That would be great. Uh, great, um, Henry. Yeah, so I think there's remarkable consistency in Leibniz's treatment of damnation throughout his life. Um, so we take the kind of central idea of the confesso is that damnation is justifiable because the damn continuously damn themselves but they keep sinning, right? Um, that's why they have the will their own damnation. Uh, and that's the same response he gives to the problem. So in the in theodicy, the question is raised of how uh, infinite I eternal punishment could be um, appropriate for a finite sin. And Leibniz's response is that the damned, they sin endlessly. So you get endless punishment because you get endless sinning. And he writes in the Sea, after this life, there's always in, ma in the man who sins, even when he is damned, a freedom which renders him culpable and a power, albeit remote, of recovering himself. Um, we should take the same idea in Confessio. And, and, and particularly um, in the Petit Fable at the end of the theology that Paul was talking about, we get the very similar response from damnation. Uh, Sext has complained, he kind of gives another version of the complaint of the damned to God. He said, you know, why have you condemned me to be wicked, unhappy, change my lot, you know, save me? Um, and Jupiter offers him, sorry, Jupiter, Jupiter offers him the choice of whether to give up the kingship and be happy, or whether to commit his crimes, be king and be damned. Uh, and Sextus freely chooses his own misery, and that's offered as a justification of damnation. Um, so that stays in place throughout um, we also have this, yeah, I mean, yeah, um, in the, yeah, so yeah, also in the Theodicy, we have the same idea that, you know, grace is offered to everyone and that all is needed is like to allow the love of God to emerge. Um, so kind of this universal grace, uh, well, yeah, so the idea that love is sufficient, love of God is sufficient salvation, is something that's retained. Um, well, yeah, I guess the reason we don't really focus on confession is because you get the really rich treatment of psychology of damnation, but um, the idea, that the damned must gain pleasure from their own um, sinning, from the damnation. It must continue because Leibniz keeps the same psychology um, that we're motivated by pleasure and the experience of harmony. Uh, so something like that must be in place, even the theodicy, uh, even later Leibniz. Um, I can't quite remember the passage. He talks about the highwayman somewhere in the theodicy who 
develops a habit of taking pleasure in his own vice. And I think the idea is then that the damned or the vicious take a kind of pleasure in the exercise of their own power because it's kind of that's kind of again the experience of their own perfection. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think I think yeah, there is um, yeah in, in the kind of in the elements I focus on in the discussion of damnation. I think um, I think there's uh, yeah surprising consistency throughout his, uh, throughout his career. Paul, do you want to jump in here? Well, it's really that I wanted uh, Osner to say a bit more because Dan had asked her about kind of why the emanation stuff disappears. And I kind of, you know, I know she has some things that she thinks about that. So um, if she wants to say more about that, I wanted to encourage her to um, do so. <laughs> I'd also like Henry to talk a little bit more about whether there are really any hints of the... Uh, emanationist um, 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 conception of God um, in the confessor and the papers surrounding it, but as not. Thank you. That I, I was annoyed that I forgot, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, that, that's a, that's a, a question I'm trying to answer in, in, my, in my thesis. I'm trying to see um, what makes him change? And I, I think the answer is, is going to be a little boring. It's, it has a lot to do with Spinoza, I think, in many ways. It's just um, in the, when he realizes, when, he's, when he reads the ethics uh, and, and sees the, the Spinozan system fully articulated and he sees the consequences of this necessitarianism, uh, I think he just realizes the need for um, there to be a, a choice, a divine choice. So he boosts his... His uh, notion of the divine will makes it a lot more robust. And he also, um, so, so yeah, he, he has a notion of the will and he also introduces unactualized possibles, which becomes sort of the main strategy, of course, uh, against uh, necessitarianism. So th it's, it's, that strikes me as, uh, as, as the, the, the most general story to tell there. And it happens in the late 70s, 1670s. Um, That's not boring at all. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> okay. No. In that case, I'm I'm relieved. <laughs> All right, Henry. Uh, yeah, sure. I, I guess yeah. I'm not sure how crucial the malicious view of God is in well, its concept of damnation. I think the interesting thing is, as others have quoted, is the equation of God with universal harmony in the confession. And this is kind of the really. I mean, I said, you know, I said. It's kind of claim that people who don't even have never heard of the Christian God, whoever hates nature, the world also hates God. And that's kind of really weird. That's kind of a strange claim. Um, that doesn't seem at all plausible. Um, but I think the, the I think the, the kind of the real idea there, it's kind of one and the same, whether God is the target of your hatred or the world, because it just leads to the same misery. So you kind of the same diagnosis of the suffering of you know non-theists and atheists as those of those who believe in God but rebel against him. Um so it's interesting elsewhere he writes, um even to desire, Professor, even to desire in such a way that makes you suffer, if it is not satisfied, is a sin and a kind of concealed anger against God and against the present state of things and against the series and universal harmony on which the present state of things depends. Um, so I guess it, yeah, I guess, yeah, yeah so it's, 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 it's really, I guess it's the idea that kind of, you can kind of demythologize it, you can kind of, God can stay out the picture. Um, you know, it, it's the problem, the problem is, uh, yeah, the problem is is um, a gap between the way how you want the world to be and the way the world is, and that leading to a kind of resentment towards the world, which then manifests itself in anger and then gets turned. And then you kind of yeah, engage in the process. He talks about turning that into a fully full, fully fleshed out worldview, uh, which you then kind of like you know provide justification for it. You kind of flesh it out. Uh, and the strings, yeah, I think yeah, isn't yeah. Yeah, so I guess that's really, yeah, that's really stopped there, actually. Um, thank you. Uh, Paul, your hand is up. Did you have something to add, or was it just... Yeah, I mean, I think oh, there's, th this is, I mean, this is very speculative, really, but I think there's then a really interesting dimension. You know, if if one is left with hating the world and a commitment to the necessity of the structure of the world, then one is in a very difficult position in terms of the possibility of freeing oneself from that if one treats the world as emerging from a being that's a person 
then there is a different way in which one can relate to the fact that the world has a certain kind of structure because it becomes possible for that structure to be good. And I think that's really the problem with Spinoza is that the structure of the world cannot be evaluated. So insofar as one is alienated, you know, the best one can do is the kind of stoic patience, but there's no way of, you know, we can help ourselves to a personal relationship with reality because that enables a certain kind of being at home with, you know, the the inevitable imperfection of things. Um, so that, that I think there's a, yeah, again, very speculative, but the, I wouldn't say this is particularly novel with Leibniz, but the survival of a personalist metaphysic, I think it is a function of the way that it can play this deep role in, in our moral psychology understood as something which is, is eudaimonistically oriented, that it does in fact enable us to be at, at ease with our lot and then to take pleasure in the good things that there are and to conceive of them are good as well. So I think there's some really interesting, I think some of these things that Osna does pick up on as in, in her thesis, which I do know obviously because she's working at Oxford. And, and so I think there, there's a lot more that Leibniz is doing that you might think you could tie into those kinds of issues. It, it, again, it requires, yeah, it does require being a bit creative, but um, yeah, it kind of makes it a bit more fun, I think as well. Thank you. Right, uh, Clara. Um, so I've been having a few internet problems and I hope this, this works. Um, yeah, I've, I've got a question for, for everyone of it. Um, so it uh, departs from Paul's um, presentation and um, it almost sounded as if the three views presented are um, sort of more rational, um, reasoned uh, uh, theories, say, and then um, his own work on it um, seems to be almost like maybe he didn't want to see that this way, but almost sort of mystical, um, like something we have to interpret. And um, so I'm just wondering how the three of you see um the way of presentation here linked to to Leibniz's idea of how reasonably accessible the the theme can be resolved in the end so um in uh in Asna's uh, presentation I I saw like oh the tensions they somehow remained and in a lot of quotes you gave um it was also almost like an interpretative style, right? And that was used to almost kind of retain those tensions. Um, and in, in uh, Paul's presentation, I kind of saw the same thing. So the, the um, resolution doesn't seem to be to resolve the tensions entirely, but to kind of give an interpretative story through which we can um, make say evil evil explicable um but not in a, a fully rationally graspable way but more in a sort of interpretative way but in henry's uh, presentation i saw a bit more of like the idea oh no there there is the claim that this needs to be sort of fully rationally explicable how how is it possible that um, the human being can have a sinful will? So, um, yeah, so my, my question is sort of, do you think um, that Leibniz thought uh, the theme of why there's evil in human will um, and how it is um, unifiable with the idea of a good God is fully rationally resolvable or um, maybe not? Um, who wants to go first? I suggest Paul goes first. I think it's... Uh... <laughs> Great. You've that been volunteered, Paul. <laughs> no. That's <an> answer. <laughs> I think very clearly no, because he, I mean, the, the, the admission that the 
the world is indefinitely complex and of course god is is absolutely infinite um i think you know there are things that are said at the beginning of the theodicy which essentially say well there's there's clearly no problem here because we're finite and we try to make sense of what it is to be finite in in a sea of infinity so you know and then there's the kind of suggestion that there is a story to be told and that god has that story available and that then there's a question of whether some stories might be converging on that better than others. It's very peculiar to suggest that there is a a, a univocal story to be told about the way things are, given that these infinities have been put into the picture. But whatever the status of that story, it's clear that it's inaccessible to us. Um, there are certain ways in which we can, by analogy, help ourselves to feel that that story exists and that the story is such that um it's the story of the best you know things being the, the best they could have been but the idea that it's really intelligible i think is um yeah i think i think you can see that in the end you you can well i don't know if he thinks you should wean yourself off the need for that but um certainly that it seems very clear that our finite comprehension is radically inept. Um, I don't see how you can escape that given given these kind of commitments that come in very, very early on. Uh, no. uh, yeah, I think maybe Henry wanted to comment oh. or would you like to yeah. go first, Henry? I don't mind if you'd like to go first, I'm happy the way. Oh, go ahead, I can come okay. after okay. you. Okay, well, yeah, it just, yeah. Not disagreeing, but yeah, there's obviously a reason why he engages in so much rational stuff. Um, I think it's certainly, yeah, so it's certainly true that kind of the, 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 on the right state to be in for life, and it is one where you're in a kind of you know, second personal loving relationship with God on the model of the normal relations we have, which, which is kind of better, and you're kind of full of love and you're just doing things on the basis of love. And in that kind of state of grace, you don't need to, you know, you're not going to be asking for reasons about either. Uh, you're not going to need a kind of whatever, the rational stuff. Um, but clearly, uh, obviously, that we worry that some people fall out of that natural state. And that's a natural state because, um, you know, our, that's our, that's our deepest nature is to take pleasure in perfection. So um, that's kind of natural state, really. In, in the theodicy, he kind of he says something about, you know, the only way we need to cooperate in grace is by stop resisting it, right? So, in a sense, you know, all, all, the only thing we're doing to stop grace is resisting it. We fall out of this natural state. Um, I think it's because he says some we develop kind of anxieties about the world's justice. You know, uh, we start to worry. It looks really unfair. Um, we start to worry about things like our own mortality, and that kind of puts us out of the state of grace, and it stops us from kind of functioning naturally. Um, and one, and you know, and to to alleviate the kind of anxieties, the anxieties that undermine our moral motivation, our happiness, uh, we or at least some of us are going to need. Um, rational explanations and we're going to need, and, and the rational explanations and let's go the pragmatism they, they'll need to go as far as they need to to alleviate the anxiety right and how far the rational explanation is going to go is going to depend on how much how far they need to go to alleviate a particular anxiety um and i think sorry, i don't just draw back this is very so so in the yeah so, and i think this again this is where life is so similar to someone like luther when luther involves the will he said you know he says when luther engages with question about theodicy he says look you know if you're in the state of grace you don't need you wouldn't be asking about this because you just you, that's not the kind of way you act in the state of grace just be moved by love but even he's he said he's happy to engage in reason even though he can't kind of suspicious of reason insofar as it works as a therapeutic to get people back to the state of grace so i think yeah so i think clearly there's a role for reason to play um and it, it, the rational explanation needs to go as far as it needs to go um to alleviate the anxieties I was going to say something similar to, I mean, yeah, that there is a reason why he keeps he keeps engaging in these in these trying to articulate things. Uh, but he, uh, it's typical, I suppose, that he he uh, he's concerned with demonstrating the probability of the mysteries and not necessarily the how the mysteries take place. And it's all it's always just um, it's intended to be sufficient for us to not to be too disturbed by the by by objections that we come up with and because we are rational beings um so but but as for your question regarding the early stuff i'm um i hope i've understood your question correctly but i think many of the tensions that i that i uh talked about are due to 
uh, the fact that it's not really a stable position at that time. So he's he's experimenting. I think Morgens Lerke calls it um, the the De Summarari. He calls it a philosophical laboratory. So he's sort of he's sending off uh, metaphysical test balloons. Uh, Lerke writes and just seeing seeing how how things work out. So I'm not sure if they are tensions he intended to to, to leave in there. Um, maybe that's that's more the case with later later writings. Yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, could I actually ask a follow up about the presentation style? Um, I think this is to, to Paul. I was wondering about the connection between the three episodes and about that reference he makes to like um, them, or at least the first two being concessions to curiosity. So I was wondering whether there is some presentation, there are aspects that have to do with lower passions like curiosity or lower fun functions like imagination. And for those you can have different strategies to it, it's fine to reply to a fable with a fable or to you know exercise this part of of the mind and they might not have a very big significance for the for the, for the system as a whole and more as a rhetorical strategy for different kinds of readers with different psychological profiles i think that's that's got to be right but i think that um the the interesting i mean the thought that I think people would probably have would be that these rhetorical strategies are ones that, you know, are needed for the vulgar. And that once one elevates oneself, then something like a, you know, it's a commitment to a uncovering the, the the true story about the nature of reality is is what we're all going to do. And that's the regulative ideal because there is such a story there. God's story. But I think that, yeah, so I, I want to suggest that in fact, what's happening with the with the not just the, the the dialogue, but the dialogue is an instance of, you know, the idea that Leibniz is one of the characters, of course, is key. Um, and that it's it's not that the vulgar need to engage in a different kind of um thinking. Um, everybody does in order to to get to this super rational mode of being, which Henry's talking about. Um, reason then becomes, you know, you've got this kind of, let's use on the one hand, let's use some kind of Nietzschean Freudian language. So you've got a kind of morality system and a reality system, both of which Leibniz takes really, really seriously as playing a crucial function in our ability to become virtuous. And, Internal to those are certain kinds of commitments. So you can't be committed to reason and the use of reason unless you take it to be the case that there's a determinate fact of the matter that's there to be investigated. So I think, you know, again, to come back to what Henry's saying, if if we fall back into using the tool of reason, which Leibniz thinks is fantastically important, maybe we all need to use it. This is maybe this is part of our finitude, is that. Um, now, there's not going to be a Kantian transcendental argument there that is necessary, but there might be more like a McIntyrean rationality of traditions argument. This is, you know, it's there. It's there to be used. You know, he, he sort of implies at certain points. If you've got something better and you've got good reason to think that it's going to do a better job, I'll listen to you. Otherwise, I'm going to go with tradition. And this is an absolutely central part of tradition, similarly with morality. Um they they've tr stood the test of time but clearly then you've got these other weirder things going on which people have not particularly wanted to pay attention to um but it's kind of not that weird because if you just pay attention to what he says about the three levels of justice you've already got this thing which is higher than the adherence to the morality system as the you know the most valorized conception of justice which is uh, entering into this kind of second personal relationship to reality. Um, that's precisely what the monodology allows you to do. And the panorganicism allows you to disclose reality as consisting of um, purely of intersubjective relationships. Um, and all of that it seems to be beyond reason in the sense that it's not conceptualizable um, in the way that um, one conceptualizes insofar as one's trying to tell a the true story about the nature of things so yeah i mean i think that it's you i agree with you 100 but what i want to inject back into it is the thought that 
it's not to alleviate some, you know, failure of the passions in favor of the triumph of reason. That that does need to happen. Reason needs to quell the passions. But then something weird has to happen that transcends reason as well. And then what you get is these kind of purified passions. That is very really helpful. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Who was next? Christopher and Noble. Uh, thank you. So actually, so my question was sort of related to, to what Claudia asked. Um, so I guess if I could just maybe ask, make a quick comment and then ask a follow-up question to, to Paul. Um, I, I guess I, piggybacking on what Paul, I, I mean, it strikes me these curiosities are, are not necessarily for the, the vulgar. I mean, certainly the second one, you know, it's a, it's a sort of very obscure sort of gene genealogical sort of phil philological point um, that, you know, I presumably would only be really of interest to sort of some of the people who are, you know, already interested in such things, right? So I guess that's, it, it strikes me, yeah, it's not necessarily, I, I mean, yeah, it might be weird to read it as sort of like, concessions for people who are simple-minded in some sense or, or anything like that. But I guess in terms of a, a, a follow-up question, I'm curious what you make of the significance of the third curiosity being at the end of the text, right? So in other words, it's when you get to after reading through this, all this sort of this, this long, you know, long, long book about, about damnation and about, about divine justice. Um, and then you get this sort of, you know, nice story at the end, right? Um, which, you know, is in some way concession to curiosity, evidently given this, this quotation. So or given this passage that you pointed to, Paul. So I guess if you could sort of speak maybe a little bit to the, the significance of it maybe being at the end of, of this sort of larger work and what might be, what might be the last thing we read, you know, I guess excluding, let's say, the Causa Dei. Um, yeah, I mean, well, I mean, I you know, if I'm going to go down this kind of, with this, this hermeneutic track, um, then I'm going to say that what he's doing is he's, you know, is it's a, a nod and a wink to the other Illuminati. He's saying, look, you know, I've been there. Um, you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes the world seems to have this. And, and you know, interestingly, when one looks at the well-attested, um, you know, different ways of being a mystic. Um, so insofar as that, you know, the literature has these different characterizations of these strange experiences. And one of them is this, um, the experience of everything being alive and flowing from some living principle. Um, so I don't think it's crazy to think that whether Leibniz takes himself to have had this experience or not is another matter, but that he's willing to suggest that the, the that there's some regulative role that that kind of um, sense of the beatific vision should play, and the denouement is to suggest that 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 beatific is vision is available. Um, then maybe you've got this kind of thing about Leibniz, you know, always been a bit anxious about the fact that if you get too joyful, then maybe you really need some deontology to get you back into shape and that you shouldn't allow yourself to get carried away. And maybe that, you know, that stuff about, I mean, that's what I was hinting at at the end. There's a kind of anxiety maybe about going with it, but he does talk about owning it. So that, I guess, is where faith has to come in. Certain, but it's not, it, it's a, the kind of faith as in commitment to harmony. I mean, it's not commitment to a personal God in a straightforward sense at that, at that point. Um, but it is also the case that, um, sorry, I'm, I'm bringing in too many things at once, I realise. But um, it is the case that as well as talking about God as having the divine attributes of, in the traditional sense, we get, I mean, God is said, the nature of God is said to be harmony. I mean, I think Henry alluded to that at one point, or maybe it was alluded to it at one point. So there are passages where we get this kind of more, um, yeah, the slightly less personal sounding characterization of what it is to to have a psychology and that sounds very platonic of course in a way um that and and that this experience of being part of an infinitely harmonious reality is ultimately what it is to have a sense of being in the best possible world and i think that he's gesturing yeah i mean i'm going to say he's gesturing at the fact that that experience has been had by him, maybe under strange circumstances, maybe not all the time, maybe such that he's not entirely sure what to make of it. Um, but he does want to, you know, I mean, something that puzzled me from very early on when reading the Theodicy was, I thought, okay, so if you believe that God exists, obviously there isn't really a problem of evil. 
in some sense. There's an existential problem and there's all the, the Dostoevsky worries and horrendous evil worries. But in some sense, if you're willing to do rational theology, there isn't a problem. But then the question is, why believe that there is the kind of God that produces the best of all possible worlds? Um, and I'm kind of suggesting that that's got to be a matter of phenomenology in the end. One would only take it seriously if one took oneself to have had it revealed to oneself or one was willing to tack on to a tradition which had that as something that had been revealed to someone. And it, it has to be an experience of God. God has to be experienced by somebody. And obviously we've got, you know, a willingness to say either that it's, you know, Moses is playing that role, Abraham's playing that role, or Jesus in some funny way is playing that role. And I'm suggesting that Leibniz is, is actually quite radical in so far as he's willing to say we can have personal revelation. He's worried about the kind of enthusiasts that Dan's talking about earlier who think that they've experienced God. But I don't think that that means he thinks one can't experience God in this very direct way. And then he'll draw on these these passages from Paul where, you know, God is is within us and those kinds of things that Luther also draws on, um, which suggest a real intimacy with God um, that one might think ought to reveal itself if one was open and willing to accept grace. And, um, so I, I think there's yeah, I think that's kind of why that's the denouement. It's saying there's there's a real experience to be had here and it might not be everlasting. We might fall off the wagon and might even wonder whether it really happened. Um, but it did, I think. And one of the things we should do is trust that it did, a trust that is there to be had again um, and and encourage it to happen again by by being open to the possibility of it. So that's why I think it's the dinner. And it can't be argued for. That's the point. You have to trust that that experience is there to be had because somebody's reporting that they've had it, albeit in this slightly veiled way, because nobody's going to. Leibniz doesn't like the people who go around saying, I talk to God. He thinks that's a big problem. Uh, so if he's going to do it, he can't quite do that. Um, you know. Thank you. Yeah, it's like the bit in Life of Brian, you know, he's not going to say he is the Messiah. Um, Great. That is lovely. Who... Can I ask a, oh, yeah, I... a question now? Oh, yes, okay, great. Wait. Yeah, go on. Yes, I wanted to mention to Henry that Leibniz's Lutherism, it seems to me that someone who's internally damned has absolutely no hope. I mean, absolutely none. Because if there were a way of getting out of it, then I don't see how it's eternal. And I don't know what role grace plays. I just want to mention one thing. Remember, Lutheranism Luther, uh, uh, there is no purgatory. There is no way that for agency in the world through, you know, indulgences to move people out of damnation. So would you say, is there any way you feel that Leibniz would allow for someone to get out of the vicious circle? Um, right, yeah, and there must be. Um... Yes, there must be. Uh, I mean, I didn't, I didn't mean to say it was Lutheran in every aspect. Um, and I think possibly the short term damnation is one that disagree on, round, answer in a roundabout way. So he says, uh, he says things that often sound kind of ultra Pelagian, which presumably put him right against Luther. For instance, in the 1686 Examen in Religionis Christiana, he writes, all human right, beings yeah. not give sufficient grace so lot, that as long as they sincerely will their salvation, nothing more is required for it that is not in their power. You know, that's how we play it, and it also suggests that those, you know, yeah. whatever, in the afterlife, even if you seem damned, you may be able to do something to get back. But again, it's kind of interesting what, what he means by what exactly is in our power. And I think that's when he, you can kind of see the Lutherans come through. So another another quote from Theodicy, he writes, what is it? Um, for conversion is purely the work of God's grace, wherein man cooperates only by resisting it. But human resistance is more or less great. Yeah, whatever. Uh, sorry, yeah, yeah. So, and just as there is no cooperation in ice when it's broken, so we, when we achieve uh, salvation by our own work, we're not actually doing anything. Right, it's an entirely passive process. Our cooperation is entirely passive. It's just to stop resisting God's grace. I think that's going to sound something that would be more amenable to Luther. Um, the grace is already there. We're presumably 
if you know if grace is just love in God, then that love is already <laughs> God's already trying to work His love through us, and we just need to cease resisting it. So then, yeah, so yeah, so that's I think, and I think that that sounds something that will be amenable to Luther, and then presumably as it applied to damned, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. There's got to be some way they can get out of it. Uh, how is that for damn nice that work? <laughs> We're kind of confusing. I guess it's. it's I mean, it's supposed, I guess it's supposed to understand their own psychology, right? Because he's he, what he's saying in the confess show is that the damned are always kind of kind of bad faith. They're kind of concealing something from themselves. That's why he talks about a concealed anger. So there's a kind of real anger, which is just seems this kind of like this kind of resentment that the world isn't the way they want it to be, and that they do an awful lot of work, rational work, in kind of rationalizing that. That basic resentment, um, that basic alienated resentment. So I think the idea is they need to, yeah, come to understand their own psychology and the kind of hidden aspects that are driving their theorizing. And that would be at least one route to kind of, yeah, one route to letting go of your letting go. I guess because it was just that if it's just a matter of resisting God, and it's just a matter of letting Thank go. You. You, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Well, if nobody has anything to add, then I think we can um, end here. Thank you, everyone, for a great uh, session and for a great semester. This is our last talk of the year. Um, great. You. And you, possibly see you next year. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.